my second talk is related to another very important complications in obstetrics. So I think my, my topic is very, very important and um, the question to me was whether we can predict spontaneous secretion by, by ultrasound. So why is this issue important? I think I don't need to explain much and I'm sure this is also a very important issue in Vietnam because um, well, across the globe, across the world, there are 50 million preterm births each year which account for more than 10% of all births. And despite our efforts in the last 50 years in preventing this adverse outcome, the rate continues to rise. I think owing to the fact that there are now uh, more women having IVF and having twins and there's an aging population. So the rate of preterm birth is rising and there are a million uh, newborn deaths uh, related to this uh, outcome each year. So we must do something to try and reduce the rate of preterm birth. And let me start with the, this slide because, um, yes, we know that the definition of preterm birth is when the delivery happens before 30 seconds. But in my talk, I'm going to relate uh, to early preterm birth, which is before 34 weeks. Although the incidence is only 1.7%, but the proportion of um, um, babies with adverse outcomes, long-term problems related to prematurity, falls within this small group of babies. So let's go back to where I came from in the UK and um, now I'm in Hong Kong and uh, so but it's interesting. The National Screening Committee issued a statement in 2015 stating that screening for preterm birth for, by the measurement of cervical length for all women, meaning universal screening, for the risk of preterm birth is not recommended. And this is absolutely against what I practice, but this is a very strong statement from the United Kingdom. But let's go through why we should not follow this uh, recommendation. First of all, if we just screen for preterm birth based on history, let's look at this slide, very simple. If we look at 120,000 births, we know that half the women will be in a first pregnancy, and only 0.4% would have had a second trimester miscarriage in the past. And in the remaining 50%, they are Paris women, and having had a previous preterm birth was only 4%. Okay? Only a small number of women having had a previous history of preterm birth. And if we take <coughs> spontaneous preterm birth before 34 weeks of gestation, and let's look at the contributions of each group. In others, only 4% having had a previous second trimester miscarriage, and in the mountains, only 28% having had a previous preterm birth. What it means is that, based on history, we can only achieve a detection rate of 16%, okay? Meaning that we are missing 84% of women that could be benefiting from some sorts of preventative measures. So the impact on overall preterm birth rate, if we focus on the women with prior history of preterm birth or second trimester miscarriage, is very, very low. And therefore, we must have methods of screening in the remaining 84% of women. Yeah, you will agree with that. And how do we do that? I think the main thing is, yeah, again, although I say history, uh, the way we've done it is not good. But let's look at what we can do better with maternal risk factors, as well as a very simple uh, ultrasound parameter, which is the measurement of survival length. History, this is the basis of all our screening methods by the Human Health Foundation. History is important, and the question is how do we utilize the information of history? And again, we use a mathematical approach to combine all the known risk factors for preterm preeclampsia, uh, preterm birth. As you can see, if a woman is uh, shorter, the risk is higher. If a woman is of a certain ethnic group, if she smokes, if she's conceived with IVF, and if she's had previous preterm birth or second trimester miscarriage, then the risk is higher. And most of 
importantly, we need to reduce our woman's risk if she's had a successful term birth. And more importantly, we need to account for the number of affected pregnancies. As you can see, if she's had one previous preterm birth, the risk is increased by a factor of 10. But if she's had two previous affected pregnancies, then her risk is increased by a factor of 20. So I think this is why we believe that we must use a multivariate regression approach. But sadly, unlike for preterm preeclampsia, preterm birth is a lot more heterogeneous in terms of the underlying pathophysiology, physiology, and the prediction is only at 33% for a false positive rate of 10%. Taking history, meaning a third of the job done. So can we progress from that? As I mentioned, the National Screening Committee from the United Kingdom said that we should not screen every woman for spontaneous preterm birth. This is because the measurement of survival length in asymptomatic women is not a reliable enough screening tool. Why do they say that? They say that there is no standardized normal measurement. They say that we don't know when we should assess cervical length, at what point in the pregnancy. They're saying that there is uncertain performance. And also, finally, they're saying that there is no method of prevention. Even though um, we know that progesterone is potentially preventative of preterm birth, and they're saying that there is not enough evidence that vaginal progesterone prevents preterm birth or death or the stability of the baby. So let's go through each of those points, if I can. Do we not have a standardized methodology for the measurements of the lake? Of course we do. And this is just a very nice 3D picture that I'm showing you. We can look at the cervical length of the sagittal approach. We can look at the dilatation uh, in the transverse approach. And that translates into many, many studies that have already evaluated the performance of the cervical length in the prediction of spontaneous preterm birth. As you can see, I'm just quoting four of the many papers. The y-axis is the risk for preterm birth. And x-axis is the cervical length. And you can see that there is an inverse relationship, meaning that the shorter the cervix, the higher the chance of spontaneous preterm birth. And this risk goes up exponentially when the cervical length is around 15 to 25 millimeters. Before, we were quoting a cervical length of 15 millimeters to be a high risk cutoff. But now, we are saying that if you have a cervical length of 25 millimeters or less, then you are at a higher risk. So this video is just showing you how we measure cervical length. Thank you. And so on the left, we have a colleague of mine preparing for the vaginal probe, cleaning it before using it, putting a, a sterile condom over the probe. And then a woman must have an empty bladder because a full bladder could falsely give you a long cervix. We introduce the probe into the vagina and then you can see that it has not progressed, the video got stuck, but you can see that on the right. This is a video of a short cervix that you got cervical funneling, which is the dilatation of the internals. And in this video here, we've got an open cervix, okay? And then the, this you can diagnose easily. Okay, and when you do the cervical length measurement, you measure from the internal os to the external os. Not to worry. We'll go over the standardized methodology. And the night, the National Screening Committee in the United Kingdom believes that we don't have standardized methodology, but we do. Okay, we must have an empty bladder, we must use a transvaginal transducer, not transabdominal, because if you go for a transabdominal approach, then you need a full bladder. And a full bladder is going to falsely lengthen your cervical length, okay? You introduce a probe and you place it in the anterior fornix. Then you identify three things. One is the endocervical mucosa, okay? And you identify the internal os and the external os. You need to pull back the probe a little bit to avoid pressure on the cervix. Because again, if you push too much, you are going to lengthen the cervix. You need to ensure that the picture has the cervix occupying 75% of the screen. Then you need to measure the distance as a straight line from the internal to the external os. To save your time, you mustn't waste your time to trace the cervical length. Okay? And then as, I, as you can see, this is an easy 
approach, straight measurement. And why do we say that we mustn't trace? Because, as you can see, a short surface is always a straight line. So I don't want you to waste your time tracing a curved long surface, okay? Then you need to take measurements over three minutes because cervix is a muscular structure and it may change. And you should use the shortest measurement for the risk assessment. And we have demonstrated that uh, the measurement of cervical length by transvaginal scan is highly reproducible. So I have already rebutted the nice uh, uh, argument that we don't have standardized methodology. We do. How about performance? So let's look at this very complex graph. On the left, you can see the two <coughs> frequency distributions of cervical length and the rate of pre uh, birth before 34 weeks. The black bars represent the normal term deliveries. The purple bars represent the spontaneous pre birth before 34 weeks. If we go for a cutoff of 15 millimeters or less, we achieve a screen past the rate of 1% for a detection rate of 20%. If we go for 20 millimeters as a cutoff, the screen past the rate goes up to 2%, but the detection rate increases to 28%. And as for 25 millimeters, we achieve a uh, detection rate of 38% for a screen past the rate of 7%. You may say that this is not fantastic, but this is what we have right now. And if you combine the measurements of survival length with history, and you can see on the right hand side, if we were to predict for very early preterm birth before 28 weeks of gestation, we achieve a detection rate of 85%. As for preterm birth between 28 to 30 weeks, we achieve a detection rate of 65%. And then the detection rate reduce, reduces to about 55% for the late preterm group. So again, second point, we do no performance screening with the use of cervical length. It's not the best. It's achieving moderate prediction. But right now, after so many years of research, this is what we have. Do we have a method of prevention for preterm birth? I think we do. Although the NICE has mentioned that there is no, not enough evidence to support the use of progesterone in the prevention of preterm birth in women with short cervix. So let's make reference to two uh, major randomized trials that we have seen over the last 10 years. The first one was from our group, and that was published in 2007. And what we did was we, we screened uh, women with a short cervix using a cutoff of 50 millimeters or less. And we randomized women to receiving progesterone or placebo between 24 to 34 weeks. And you can see that the rate of delivery before 34 weeks was reduced by 44%. And as for another, another study that was done in America, and you can see that, achieving 45% reduction. Although the screening criteria was a little bit different, because they have learned from our trial that if we give progesterone to women with a very, very short cervix of less than 10 millimeters, the impact of progesterone is not as good. So they focused on screening women with a cervix of 10 to 20 millimeters. And they gave progesterone, which is a different preparation, a gel preparation of 90 milligrams between 20 to 37 weeks. And they saw a 45% reduction in the rate of delivery before 33 weeks. So I don't believe that we don't have uh, evidence to support the use of progesterone in women with a short cervix. And just making reference to whether this is a cost-effective approach. So let's compare screening for preterm birth with the use of cervical length coupled with the use of progesterone for the prevention of this adverse outcome to other medical uh, methods, medical conditions, such as perhaps made for cervical cancer. The number needed to screen is over 1,000. How about for breast cancer using mammography for old women uh, aged above 50? The number needed to screen is over 500. And for younger women, the number needed to screen is massively at over 3,000. And as for prostate-specific antigen for prostate cancer, again, at a very high number needed to screen number of over 1,200. And where do we stand with preterm birth? Using cervical length, 
for prevent, uh, to prevent one case of preterm birth is one uh, number needed to screen is 357. And then for preventing neonatal morbidity and mortality, number needed to screen is only 200. So I think it is a no-brainer that we need to stop thinking that we're not having an impact on overall uh, preterm birth rate and uh, the associated uh, 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 outcomes from an authority. So how about using cervical length to predict for labour in women presenting with threat of preterm labour? This is something that I do routinely in my unit. All my doctors, all my junior doctors are trained if a woman presents with threatening preterm labor. We don't waste our time. We do a transfer general scan to look at the cervix. So this is a very nice slide on the left. You can see that again, the cervical length has a negative relationship with the risk of preterm birth in women presenting with preterm labor. The shorter the cervix, the higher the risk of preterm birth. And if you have a very long cervix, the risk is only 5%. So perhaps we can relax a little bit because there's probably no need for aggressive tocolysis. There's no need for steroids. And there's no need to transfer a woman to level three unit so that uh, appropriate special care baby unit care is provided. Okay? However, if a woman has a very short cervix of less than 20 millimeters and she's contracting, then of course her risk is substantially increased to 77%. And we know that this woman needs tocolysis, we know that this woman needs steroids to uh, plan for delivery. And, and so this is a very easy method that we can use to predict for preterm labor in symptomatic women. But what do we do in the, oh, sorry, go back. What do we do for this particular group? I mean, the women with a, with a cervix between 20 to 30 millimeters is still at risk. There's a one in five chance that she will have a delivery within seven days. So what can we do? Can we do better to isolate a group of women that will benefit from tocolysis and steroid? Then maybe we can introduce a, a second test, something called the fetal fibronectin. And this is basically a glycoprotein that is essentially released between the, the, the interfaces between the decidua and the chorion. And obviously there is some work that has looked at the use of phenofibronectin in the screening for preterm birth in asymptomatic women. As you can see, the performance of screening is comparable to the measurement of cervical length. But why don't we use this test? Because it means we don't need to have the skills to measure cervical length. We can just simply do a spectrum examination, take a swab to look for this fetal vibrating. The problem with this is that it is very costly. It is probably costing 330 US dollars for one single test, and this is not going to be cost effective. And more than importantly, we know that by treating with antibiotics in high risk women determined by this fetal fibronectin is not preventative of preterm birth. And there has been a lot of work looking at the use of fetal fibronectin in women presenting with threatened preterm labor to see if we are having an impact on the overall outcome of women and the neonates. And in this very important systematic review and meta-analysis of randomized trials, having used uh, the fetal fibronectin to guide management, and they have concluded that sadly, <coughs> fetal fibronectin does not reduce the rate of preterm birth. It does not reduce the number of hospital hospitalization in women presenting with preterm labor. It does not reduce the use of catecholytics, and it does not reduce the use of steroids. And, and it actually increases the cost, as I told you. The cost of the test is around 30 US dollars. So in the end, this meta-analysis is rather disappointing. So I think fetal fibronectin is not for universal screening in women with threatened preterm labor. I would not do it in every single woman presenting with threatened preterm labor. But can we actually couple the use of fetal fibronectin to cervical length assessment? Yes, we can. In this very nice study, 
What they did was that uh, they wanted to estimate the performance of combining survival length assessment with phenol phenol uh, lectin, um, testing in predicting delivery in women with threat of fetal labor. And basically, they used uh, a phenofibronectin past the rate and then looked at at what point of the survival length that phenofibronectin could guide management. So in a case, when you have a negative fetal fibronectin with a, with a short cervix, the risk of preterm birth within seven days is greater than 5%. So this is a high risk. And if I have a fetal fibronectin positive and with a, with a normal cervix, again, she is at risk as well. But obviously, if a woman has a very long cervix, of course she's not at risk. Her risk of preterm birth is less than 5%. And then if I have an intermediate uh, survival length of 50 to 30 centimeters, uh, millimeters, sorry, then if a ne there's a negative fetal fibronectin result, then the woman is at low risk. So in this situation, I think in the intermediate risk group, then there is a role of adding a second test, okay? And what they have concluded is that they have proposed a contingent decision rule. If I have a long cervix, woman is low risk. I will just reassure her, and if she stops having um, contractions, then she can be discharged. If she has a very short cervix of 15 millimeters or less, then of course she's high risk, and we will manage her as a high risk case with tranquilizers, uh, steroid, and transfer to an appropriate unit. And if she has an intermediate survival length, then we can do the female hypernectin to then divide women into the low risk group and the high risk group. And so they, what they did was they were able to reclassify 13% of women, meaning that 9% as low risk and only 3% delivered within seven days. So they were the true low risk women. And 3% were reclassified as high risk and 27% delivered within seven days. So another important point is uh, intra-amniotic infection. We know that the shorter the survival length, the higher the risk of intra-amniotic infection. And this is often something difficult to diagnose clinically. I mean, obviously, if a woman has a raging temperature, she's tachycardic, she's sick, she definitely has infection. What if she doesn't have any clinical symptoms? Can ultrasound guide you with um, uh, a diagnosis of intra-amniotic infection? I think it can. Have you heard of something called sludge? So basically, through a survival length assessment, yes, you can see that the survival length is short in this case. And there is sludge, as you can see, sitting just within the survival canal. And this is considered to be a potential sign of infection. So in this case, you can see that in 84 cases presenting with threatened labor, and in 20 3%, they were cases of, uh, they were observed to have slush, and then they were more likely to deliver within 48 hours. 43% compared to 4% with no slush, and delivery within seven days. 71% with a slush compared to 16% without slush. And so, this is a potential sign that you need to look out for. Okay, and then the, the presence of slush is a potential risk factor for microbial invasion of the amniotic cavity, and it is histologic choreal amniotis, and we are expecting preterm delivery. So, I think in conclusion of my talk, I think ultrasound can help us predict spontaneous preterm birth, and spontaneous preterm birth is definitely predictable and preventable. So, thank you for your attention.